Welcome to the Bronx Latino History Project. My name is Stephen Payne, librarian and archivist at the Bronx County Historical Society. Today is June 6th, 2021, and I have the tremendous pleasure of being here with Vicente Alba, known to friends and comrades as Panama. Vicente has done many things in his life, as we'll learn directly from him, but I'll just point out a few up front. He's a longtime Bronxite, a member of the Young Lords, and a lifelong revolutionary and fighter against US imperialism. So we begin these oral history interviews by asking, why don't you start off by telling us about your family's history and background and how they ended up in the Bronx? Okay. First of all, I arrived in the Bronx in 1961 at the age of 10. I came from Panama. Um, my father was a Panamanian. He married my mother, who was a refugee from Spain. My mother, my aunt, my grandfather, and my grandmother had um, been captured and put in a concentration camp in Spain, then deported to a concentration camp in France, Wow. And then deported from France, they went to um, the Dominican Republic. Then they, uh, you know, my grandfather was an anarchist who fought against Franco. Sure. And he had been wounded. And that's how he was captured and subsequently him and his family arrested. Yeah. So they arrived in the Dominican Republic and it was the Trujillo dictatorship. Sure. And um, they were going to go to Cuba, but it was the Batista dictatorship. Dictatorship. So they dictator. decided, <laughs> yeah, they decided to then immigrate to Panama. When they did so, my mother stood behind in the Dominican Republic in nursing school. That's where she graduated as a nurse sure. and then joined them in Panama. In Panama, my mother and my father met, they married, they had two children. My sister was older than me by a year and a half and myself. Um, my mother and father separated. My father came to the United States. Then in 1959, 60, they started talking about reconciling. Mm. And uh, I traveled to New York with my sister and my mother for the first time. So my father again went back to Panama, they decided to reconcile, and we immigrated uh, to New York City from Panama. Sure. Um, I, um, I traveled from Panama to New York on a boat called, called the Oakville. Mm. Uh, it, took a, it was a five day sea travel. We landed in New York. We stood in my father's friend's house, which was on Wheeler Avenue, right around the corner from Bronx River Avenue sure. in the Bronx uh, for a couple of months. And then uh, they got an apartment at 1371 Bronx River. That's where we moved in. That's where we, um, you know, got together as a family. Um, it was uh, Ron Sugar Avenue, it was a long avenue. It was um, two family homes, okay? And except, as I remember, for my landlord and the house next door, which were both owned by Puerto Rican families, uh, 
the whole block was Italian. Mm. Okay. Um, the neighborhood was changing. There were a lot of Puerto Ricans uh, in the streets and avenues. Um, but on Bronx River, it's all white. I see, yeah. Um, I, I was very um, shocked when I arrived because I had been sold this dream about the place that I was going to. Sure. The United States being the birthplace of democracy, the land <laughs> of equality, the home yeah. of the free and the brave, and all that crap. Yeah. <laughs> which is all bullshit. Absolutely. Because, you know, because um, my neighbors on my block, none of them wanted me. Yeah. They didn't want us. Okay. They weren't friendly to us. The only exception to that was the family that I lived right next door to us, not the owners of the house, but it, it, you know, it was two family homes and sometimes three family homes because they would rent out the basement. Sure, sure. They had rented, they had rented the basement to an immigrant fam, a family from Sicily, mm. uh, the Giambronis. And uh, the Giambronis were very friendly to us they were basically in the same situation. You know, they didn't speak English. Yeah. Uh, uh, they had two daughters and a son. Um, the daughters were about my and my sister's age, and they were very friendly to us. Uh, but the rest of the neighborhood, you know, the neighbors, they just didn't want nothing to do with us. Sure. Okay. So that's where I grew up. I uh, I um, arrived going to the fifth grade at PS 77, which is like two blocks away, two and a half blocks away. Um, when, uh, give me one second, please. Sure. When I arrived uh, at school, I was put in a class for the mentally challenged. Mm -hmm. I went to Five Up, which is a, a class for children with mentally handicaps. Mm -hmm. The reason I was placed there was because I didn't know any English. Okay. Sure. Um, sure. So, you know, and, and that's where I started learning English. But it's also where I continue to feel the racism, the social society's racism. Absolutely. Um, I um, made friends with kids of my own age, all Puerto Ricans, sure. all that lived uh, primarily down the block on Elder Avenue. Mm. Um, and that's where, you know, I began socializing. Um, they, um, you know, they, they, they were very welcoming to me. And because they were all Puerto Ricans, I was the only non-Puerto Ricans. They started calling me Panama, <laughs> yeah. which is a thing that has stuck forever. <laughs> okay. Um I um I had an experience uh, which to me was very defining. I must have been twelve years old. Um uh, it was the summertime. There were about thirty kids the kids on Elder Avenue. Mm. Uh, we were hanging out in the street, running up and down and in Bengolibio and all this craziness and the police came. Mm. At that time, 
early 1960s is when they first created the riot police. Yeah. And the riot units of the NYPD were made up of very big white boys. Yeah. I mean, these are like huge white men. Okay. And when they didn't have a riot to attend to, they patrolled black and Puerto Rican communities. Absolutely, yeah. And they came into our block and they rounded up all the kids that were on the block mm. and took us to a backyard. Um, and at that time, it was very common for the police to carry two things that you don't see a lot anymore. One was called a blackjack, which was a a leather ball wrapped in leather. Mm. And the other was a piece of a hose that they would hang from the pistols. Mm. Okay, and they took us all into a backyard and started beating the crap out of us. Oh, God. Okay, I didn't even hardly speak any English. Yeah. I didn't understand why we were rounded up, why we were being beaten, but I kept hearing this cop keep on yelling at me as he beat me, calling me, you fucking dirty Puerto Rican. Oh, and he God. kept hitting me with a, with a rubber hose. Yeah. And... Um, you know, I'm just a kid, yeah. not knowing what's going on, trying to get out of an ass whipping. So I tell the cop officer, not Puerto Rican, Panamanian. <laughs> and he tells me, I don't give a fuck what kind of Puerto Rican you are. Oh my God. And he kept hitting me. Wow. Okay, so I guess that day he nationalized me Puerto Rican. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Said, you know, if they're going to treat me like a Puerto Rican, then I am a Puerto Rican. Yeah. That was the basis of my understanding at that time. For sure. Um, there, you know, I went from PS 77 to junior high school 123, James M. Kieran, junior high school 123. Um, and, you know, there was a lot of that tension, a lot of that racial tension, and it was um, a lot of tension with the white kids and a lot of tension with black kids, Yeah, you know? Yeah. Um, and I, um, you know, I got into a fight. There was this black kid that um, I, I, I used to have, I, I, I you know, I, I had very long, lazy hair. And there was a black girl that really loved my hair. And she would sit in the seat behind me and play with my hair and comb my hair. Yeah. And this kid, he had seen that. So one day he waited for me aside. We got into, we got into a, a fight. He was the first fight that I've had in my life that I remember, yeah. you know, um, and it was three o'clock when we were leaving school and he had been waiting for me and he hit me and I hit him back and we started brawling and a lot of kids sat around us and the teachers came back, came out and separated us and, you know, he, the teacher asked who started this fight. And I was scared shitless, but yeah. I kept my mouth shut. Okay. And the kid that I fought with kept staring me down, like, you know, let me see you punk out, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I didn't say anything. So. He finally broke and said, I started it. Because it was these kids that, you know, they didn't give a fuck. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sure. I started it. And in front of everybody, he says to me, you're all right, bro. I got your back. 
And from that day on, I was like, you know, I had, I had the backing of all the kids. Yeah. Okay. Um, so anyway, that that's the way things were. Back then, there was, and, and, and I think this is very important to say because even it's an epidemic today, but back then there was a epidemic of heroin. Sure. Okay. I mean, we started out smoking weed, you know, at lunchtime in school back then, we used to chip in 50 cents a piece. Yeah. Okay. Between 10 guys, that was $5. And with $5, we could buy a bag of repo. And a bag of repo, you could get 20 joints out of it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and, and, and if we chipped in a little more, we could get a pint of wine. Yeah. Mm. See, rose. Uh, you know? And get, and get high at lunchtime and go back to school. Yeah. Um, there was a wider epidemic, and it was heroin. Sure. And it was um, very widespread. I went from Junior High School 123 to James and Kieran. Um, heroin was being sold everywhere. So it was being sold in the schools. Yeah. You went to the bathroom, you had two, three people selling heroin in bathrooms. Wow. <clears throat> um, I began using heroin. Mm. By the time I was 14, I was using heroin and I got addicted. Yeah. Um, something that I was very fortunate about was the fact that when I got to James Monroe, I had my homeroom teacher, which was also my high school typing teacher. Yeah. Uh, his name was Richie Perez. Mm. Um, he was the youngest teacher. And as far as I remember, the only Puerto Rican teacher in a row at that time. Yeah. And he was very conscious. And he saw that I was on drugs. Yeah. And he, he approached me repeatedly about, you know, stopping using drugs. Um, by the way, if you go to James M. Kieran High School today, um, uh, James M. Kieran on 72nd Street, that corner, that's called Richie Perez Way because yeah, yeah. his name, he was given recognition, okay, for who we have been in life. He's passed away since. Um, like I said, he was the youngest high school teacher in school. Um, a brilliant man mm. and very socially conscious. You know, while we were in Monroe, um, he helped organize demonstrations against the Vietnam War. Wow, yeah, yeah. Um, and, um, you know, I remember one particular incident where, like, the whole school came out to march around the neighborhood, okay, against the Vietnam War. Yeah. And, um, you know, he, um, he was part of that demonstration. We were all out there. And the cops came. Mm. You know, and they came out with their nightsticks and everything. Yeah, break this up. And there was this young white kid with long hair, and he pulled out the United States Constitution and started reading it to the cop. <laughs> and the cop freaked out. He freaked, I mean, he didn't know what the hell to say. You know, <laughs> and everybody started applauding and we get marching, okay? Anyway, that was one example of like what the climate was back then. Yeah, okay? yeah. Um, eventually I dropped out of Moreau and Richie Perez stopped being a teacher. And um, I didn't know what happened to him. He lived in the neighborhood, but I never saw him again. Yeah. Um, and, um, Back on July the 4th, 1971, 
Um, it was a hot, sunny, beautiful day. And for all of us, the beach to go to was Orchard Beach in the Bronx. Sure. Um, so we go to the beach. The beach was crowded. And um, they had signs along the boardwalk that said, you know, sitting, no smoking, no spitting. And, of course, we were all sitting on the handrails, yeah. <laughs> watching the girls go by. And um, it was the first time that I remember seeing cops and scooters, mm. okay? Uh, there were cops and scooters patrolling the boardwalk. And amongst the people, there was this cop that came, and he uh, um, he um, went next to the guy, my friend that was sitting in the corner of the handrail where you go into the sand. Yeah. And he approached them and hit him with his nightstick mm. for sitting on the handrail. Okay. And my boy kicked them in the face. Yeah, yeah. And the cop dropped. And he calls out, you know, for backup. And uh, where we we're at starts getting, I mean, like many cops running on scooters and with helmets. And they just start beating people. Oh, yeah. And fight in short and uh, in on, on, on the beach. Yeah. Okay. And in the middle, I mean, like, we're throwing down against the cops. Yeah. Uh, and I look and I see my teacher, Richie Perez. Okay. He was leading a team of young lords. Yeah. That was selling the Palante newspaper on the beach. Yeah. And he was throwing down against the cops. Yeah. And all the young lords were throwing down against the cops. Sure. And in my mind, I said to myself, this doesn't get any better in life. Okay. Yeah. Hey, you have my your teacher throwing <laughs> down against the police. Doesn't Absolutely. get any better. Absolutely. Okay. It was beautiful. Um, it was a battle that went on for hours. Um and I remember that. Okay, but you know, I was on drugs. I um, I had heard about the Young Lords because the Young Lords had taken over a church in East Harlem. Sure. On 111th Street on Lexington Avenue. They called it the People's Church. And so I had heard about them. And back then, you know, I was totally sympathetic to the Black Panther Party. Sure. And the reason was not because I really understood all their politics. Yeah. But because they were fighting back. Yeah. yeah. And that too, I was very rebellious. Sure. Okay. And to me, they were an example. I said, they just. These motherfuckers are bad, and this is so. I want to join the Black Panther Party. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Um. And and then and then you know the young lords uh, get on the news uh, when they took over the church. Uh, that was the Christmas 1970, I believe, mm -hmm. and um. You know, to me, that was very important because it said to me that we were now part of the revolutionary movement in the United States. Absolutely. Okay. Um, I had not heard about the Young Lords in Chicago or anything like that. I hadn't heard about the Brown Berets in the Southwest. I heard about Panther Party. Now the Young Lords yeah. had heard about the weathermen, you know, that have fought against the police in Chicago and were now underground. And, you know, I mean, but that was my general sense. I, I love the rebellion against the system. 
Sure. Okay. But like I said, I was in drugs. Okay. Yeah. So um, one of the things was that I used to walk all over the South Bronx. Yeah. Seeking to buy the best dope available. You know, wherever you heard, oh, they got good dope here when you went over there to cop. Yeah. And in my travels, I had met a woman by the name of Cleo Silvers, mm. who was a Black Panther. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, she saw what I was into. She approached me. She started talking to me about the same, the same message. You got to get off those drugs, you know. Um, one day we were sitting on her stoop talking when she points and tells me, look over there. And I look down the block from her house. It's a patrol car. Yeah. And they were parked and the car was selling dope out the window of the patrol car. Yeah. And she tells me, yeah, you hate the cops so much, look who you give your money to. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, that got me really angry. And, sure. you know, um, she told me, look, when you're ready to stop using drugs, give me a call. Yeah. She gave me her own phone number and I kept it. Um, and I finally decided to stop drugs. I want to stop drugs and get involved. Yeah. Again, it was not political consciousness. It was um, my rebelliousness, my anger about everything that was going on. Yeah. Um, but I didn't have like a fully formed analysis or anything like that. Sure, sure. A lot of my friends were on drugs. You know, it was estimated back then that 15% of the population in this South Bronx was heroin users. Wow. People addicted to heroin. Yeah. Now, when you take into account that the population includes everyone from a newborn baby to a senior citizen ready to die, yeah, okay, and they're not the ones shooting heroin. The concentration of that heroin addiction was in teenagers and young adults. Sure. Okay. Um. By mere coincidence, I um, I decided that I had to stop. I bought myself a bottle of methadone. Yeah. I shot my last 15 bags of dope, and um, I called Cleo. Yeah. And Cleo tells me, listen, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go down to 138 shoot and there's a, a street name called Brown Place. Mm. Says so you go to this address and that is where the Puerto Rican Student Union mess hall is. Go over there, spend the night there. Yeah. Tomorrow morning, I want you to go to the Puerto Rican Student Union office and as for Pee Wee and Georgie, they're going to be waiting for you. Mm -hmm. And they'll take you someplace. She didn't tell me any more than that. Yeah. Um, and that's what I did. And when I got to the Puerto Rican Student Union office, Pee Wee and Georgie were waiting for me. And they walked with me to the old Lincoln Hospital. Mm -hmm. um, and they had just taken over the nurses' residence building of the Lincoln Hospital. Sure. Okay. To start a heroin detoxification program. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And that was November 10th, 1970. Yeah. 
Anyway, I went there, but like I said, I had my own biomedicine, so I never got detox there. Yeah. But I spent the day there. Sure. You know, I saw I met with Cleo, and uh, I remember this girl named Butch, mm-hmm. uh, who were running the takeover. The takeover was um, originally the nurses' residence. We had rooms that uh, there were at that time there were many progressive doctors, yeah. were many white. Okay, but many doctors that were progressive, that were against the Vietnam War, that were part of revolutionary organizations. Sure. Um, and they were supplying methadone for us to detoxify people with. Yeah. Out of their bedrooms where they went to sleep. Yeah. Okay. That, um, by that the end of that day, we decided that we were going to move the operation to the auditorium mm-hmm. of the nurses' residence building. Um, and we established the Lincoln Detox drug program. Sure. It was initially intended to be a 10 um, day detoxification for heroin addicts. Yeah. But what we also realized was that there were a lot of people that were addicted to methadone. Yeah, yeah. At that time was when these methadone maintenance clinics were being opened up all over the place. Sure. And um, many people coming out of the federal penitentiaries at that time, um, using heroin was a federal crime. Mm. And many people that got arrested were sent to federal prison. Yeah. In prison, you would be uh, given methadone. But when they were released from prison, many people had habits of methadone, 400, 500 milligrams a day of methadone. Yeah. And they were released back into the streets and they had no place to go. Okay. Sure. So we ran into that. So we developed um, the Lincoln Detox not only as a heroin de- detoxification, but a methadone detoxification program. Mm. And that required that we develop a methadone detox protocol. Sure. What I mean by that is that heroin, the body um, gets clean in 72 hours, three days. Okay. And, you know, we developed this 10 day program to wean people out with the after effects. Yeah. With methadone, the body's withdrawal takes a lot longer. Mm. So we found that we had to develop a protocol to detoxify people over months. Wow. Decreasing down five milligrams of methadone or something that was decreased 10, 15, 20, 25 days yeah. before you were able to lower them another five milligrams. And when you have people that were in three, four, five hundred 500 milligrams, that took a long time. Absolutely, yeah. And, um, so we developed this. Um, and we also started um, seeking alternatives to using methadone sure. because i don't know if you're aware methadone was developed in nazi germany yeah i i've heard that before. okay methadone was developed in nazi germany when they were in short supply of opium during the war yeah so they substituted using opium for using methadone yeah and we were seeking for alternatives um, about 
I don't know, maybe a year, a year and a half after we started the detox program, um, someone read in a newspaper about an acupuncturist in Thailand Mm. that had a patient with respiratory problems and was treating the patient with acupuncture. And it turned out that this patient had was addicted to opiates. Mm. And he found that by stimulating the lung point in the ear, he began to help that patient withdraw from opium. Yeah. Okay. So we went down to Chinatown. We bought ear charts of acupuncture. Yeah. And we bought acupuncture needles and we came to the Bronx and started first practicing among ourselves yeah. trying to learn acupuncture to treat people with acupuncture as an alternative sure. to methadone. Um, we have had also been seeking um, herbal treatments where up to that point we found things that help but not things that really detoxify. Yeah, at yeah. that point, um, we had never heard of things like Reiki or something like that. So we did with what we had. Sure. But always seeking to um, detoxify people. We use as our philosophical framework a booklet that had been written by a member of the Black Panther Party. Mm. He was one of the Panther 21 and ITs. Oh. Michael set away at the war. Sure. And um, he wrote this pamphlet called Capitalism for Still Because Genocide. Yeah. Oh, and we yeah, use yeah. that as the foundation for our, our philosophical foundation for the war against the heroin epidemic and drug epidemic. Sure. Okay. I, uh, when I um, got involved in Lincoln Detox, I got involved with the Young Lords. Yeah. That I was recruited into the Young Lords. Cleo Silvers, at that point, left the Black Panther Party and joined the Young Lords because the Young Lords had a long history of involvement in healthcare advocacy. Sure. In New York City and and in you know in Lincoln Hospital. Um. So she joined the Young Lords. I was recruited to the Young Lords there. Um. I. Um. My responsibilities eventually developed to being a part of the Bronx Office of the Young Lords, mm. which had been relocated from Longwood Avenue down to Cypress Avenue on 141st Street, mm. which is about three, four blocks away from the old Lincoln Hospital. Um, anyway, so that that's how I got involved. Um, and in that process, I began my transition from being a rebel yeah. to attempting to become a revolutionary. Sure. Okay. Uh, which are two different things. Okay. <laughs> and that's important. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Um the Lincoln Detox Program, as we developed it, was in existence from 1970 to 1978, mm. when Mayor Koch uh, basically yeah. took it over. Um, 
I um I continued to work with the Lincoln Detox even after I left the Young Lords. Sure. Um, I got involved in a number of other things. I was one of the founders for the Committee to Free the New York Five, mm. which was a committee, a defense committee that we sure. developed, that we uh, created to defend five members of the Black Liberation Army. Yeah. Uh, Noah Washington, um, Anthony Bottoms, mm. Herman Bell, and the Taurus brothers. The Taurus brothers were Cisco Torres, who was a Vietnam veteran, former Panther, mm. uh, who joined the Black Liberation Army, and his brother, Gabriel Torres, who had been a young lord. Mm. And so we formed that committee. While working with that committee and going through the, the trial, um, I joined the committee to free the Puerto Rican nationalist prisoners. Sure. Um, I also joined the struggle to save Ostos Community College. Absolutely. Ostos Community College. There were two community colleges in the city of New York, Mega Everett College in Brooklyn and Ostos Community College in the South Bronx. Mm -hmm. In 1974, 75, um, New York City went into a fiscal crisis and they closed Sydenham Hospital and they targeted foreclosure of the community colleges. Sure. And so I uh, actually got a call from a friend of mine um, who was a student at Ostos Community College. In Ostos Community College, they had a program called Pool, mm -hmm. Puente de Unidad Latina. Sure. Um, and it was a program that was created to bring inmates from Sing Sing to the Bronx, to Ostos Community College, to go to the community college That's and be returned back to Sing Sing in the evenings. Okay. This was a program designed for um, inmates that had no violent charges sure. and who were short-term, okay? So unlikely to run away. Yeah. Uh, they just wanted to finish their bid and get on with their lives. So they had that program. And a friend of mine was in that program. Mm. And he called me and says, listen, you got to do me a favor, bro. You got to come to Oslo to yeah. this meeting. They're having this meeting. I want you to meet the people because you know that you know, I can't get arrested. I'm already in jail, right? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, I can't get arrested. But people are bad and stuff, and, and you should be down with this. So I went. I met the people um, that were involved. Amongst them, a member of the Puerto Rican Socialist Party, Ramon Jimenez, mm -hmm. um, who was a Harvard graduate attorney and was a professor at Ostos Community College mm. um, and a member of the Puerto Rican Socialist Party. Anyway, he led a broad coalition of people and he created this coalition and we worked on this coalition to save Ostos Community College, which, which we eventually did. Absolutely. Um, we, um, while Doing that, I continued to be active in the committee to be the nationalist prisoners. Sure. And um, in 
I get the dates a little confused. 77. Yeah. Yeah, 1977. Uh, we took all, uh, 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 over Hostos College. And um, that was the summer of the blackout, the big blackout in New York City. Yeah, yeah. And that was also the summer of the Son of Sam. Yeah. Um, and New York City was going crazy and um, took over all stores. And on August 10th, if I remember, August 8th, if I remember, um, the FALN, Fuerzas Armadas de Liberación Nacional, Sure. Um, placed a bomb in the mobile oil building in Manhattan. Mm. Uh, two days later, they arrested me, accused me of putting the bomb. I was the first person in the United States arrested, accused of being a member of the FALN. Yeah. Um, that situation and all the media coverage basically made me the face of Puerto Rican terrorism. <laughs> quote unquote. Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. Um, the case was dismissed right away because they had nothing to link me to uh, the FALN. They said that I got an anonymous call, <laughs> but they would not let me listen to the anonymous call. Sure. Okay. Um, we suspect that the reason why they targeted me was because I was one of the leaders of the Committee to Free the Nationals. Yeah. Because in that organization, we supported the armed propaganda being carried, carried out by the FILN. Sure. We're the only people in New York that supported it publicly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And thirdly, because I am not Puerto Rican. <laughs> yeah. And one of the arguments that they have been making was that the Puerto Rican independence movement was not a Puerto Rican movement. Mm. It was a movement instigated by farmers. <laughs> so we suspect that, you know, I fell into the, the definition of what they were looking for and they accused me. Absolutely. Like I said, that case was dismissed, but the following year I was rearrested because now I was the face of Puerto Rican terrorism. Yeah, yeah. I uh, yeah. was rearrested and accused of possession of weapons. I spent six months in jail, came out when my bail was reduced to ten thousand dollars cash of bail mm. and the money was raised. You know, you you gotta understand ten thousand dollars in 1978 was a hell of a lot of money. Absolutely. Okay. Like a whole year's salary um, or maybe more. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, I came out of jail six months later. Uh, you know, spent five years waiting to go to trial. Mm. I went to trial and was acquitted in 45 minutes. Wow. Okay. The jury went up to deliberate and they came right back with the verdict. Um, and, you know, we walk into court and they said, not guilty. Yeah. And when the, the, the thing was that before, just before we started trial, the district attorney in charge of my case had approached me to tell me that they would drop the trial if I pleaded to appear guilty 
I they would give me a time served for the six months I had been in jail. Yeah. And I told him to go fuck himself. <laughs> you know? For sure. So yeah, I said, you know, if you got me, you convict me and then you put me in jail for yeah. whatever seven years or whatever the at that time was a charge for illegal weapons. Um I was acquitted in forty five minutes. Yeah. And then when when the judge says not guilty, read the verdict from the jury, the DA comes, turns around and grabs my hand to shake it. <laughs> and I tell him, you know, why don't you go fuck yourself? Yeah. You just try to put me in jail and now you want to shake my hand? Yeah, give me a break. <laughs> and he turned around, he turned around and tells the judge, oh, I'm out. This man just threatened my life. <laughs> so I screamed in the court. I said, Your Honor, he's a fucking liar. But <laughs> now I shall threaten you. I'll kill you, you son of a bitch. <laughs> so then I got rearrested right in the courtroom. I uh, got to the court and they went, and my lawyer, and they went back and they, they dismissed that. Anyway, that's the story of my, um, of my arrest. Wow, wow. I yeah. continued <laughs> I've continued to be active the rest of my life. Sure. Um I um I moved to Puerto Rico what eleven years ago now. Yeah. After I retired. Um and this is where I live at today and continue to show up for its independence. Sure. Absolutely. Um what about uh, your participation in the occupation of the Statue of Liberty? Okay. Uh, this is what happened. From the time that we started the campaign in New York, we would take people to Washington, D.C., demanding their release. Yeah. The nationalist prisoners were Lolita Lebrun, Oscar sure. Collazo, Irving Flores, um, uh, Rafael Cancel Miranda. Um, they had been in jail over 20 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, Oscar Collazo had actually been sentenced to die um, for his attack on Blair House. And uh, the rest of them had life sentences. Yeah. And we started this campaign on the basis that as people on the colonial domination, people have the right to fight by any means necessary. Yeah. And that they should be set free. Yeah. Um, we started mobilizing people to Washington, D.C., two, three years, already four years. We were mobilizing again. But the way we did the mobilizing was that uh, we went out Friday night, Saturday, Sundays to business centers with large Puerto Rican communities and do education with the people. Um, and from there, recruit people to mobilize sure. to Washington. Um, this year, when we uh, began the mobilization to Washington, 1978, um, a lot of people were saying, you know, we go every year and it's the same shit. They deny them the release. They try to ignore us. They, yeah. You know, uh, we have to do something more. Yeah. By that time, from 1970, or the FALN have been doing um, propaganda bombings. Yeah. And a lot of people were divided because they were not, they didn't understand. You know, many did not understand the FALN strategy, their sure. contribution. Um, but people felt that we needed to do something mass militant yeah. beyond going to Washington. So the leadership of the New York City Committee to free the nationalists, we met. There was three people. It was um, 
Richie Perez, mm. Mickey Melendez, who was actually the person that had founded the Young Lords in New York, sure, and myself. And we met to discuss the situation. And it was actually Mickey Melendez who said, wow, what about the Statue of Liberty? Yeah. Say, wow, tremendous idea. Absolutely. So um, we um, took turns. I was the first one to go to the Statue of Liberty as a tourist to do surveillance, to see how everything operated. Then Richie went, then Mickey went. Then we convened. Of course, these meetings all had to take place outside of the eyes and ears of everybody else. Absolutely. Okay? So each of these meetings was all protocol, all security protocol that we established. Um, and we um, we planned it. Okay, how to carry it out. There was a lot of debate, a lot of ideas about what we should do, how it should be done. Um, one of the debates was that I wanted to be a person going into the Statue of Liberty, but they argued against it because they said, listen, guy, if you go get locked up again, they're going to keep you. We're not going to be able to get you out. Yeah. Okay? You're already an accused terrorist. Now yeah. you get busted again, and then you're going to be in there forever. Okay? <laughs> so it was agreed that I would not go in, that I would be the spokesperson sure. for the takeover. Okay, so Richie and Mickey, uh, we organized it. So we had three teams of people that we recruited independently that did not know where they were going, yeah. but that were committed to the freedom of the nationalists. Um, <clears throat> and um, we took them to Battery Park. They got on. Then that's when they realized that we were heading. They got on the ferry. They took over the Statue of Liberty. Yeah. Um, it was um, a tremendous success, way beyond our expectations, because the way we envisioned it with all the negative press, American press, yeah, uh, for the cause of Puerto Rican independence and the freedom of the nationalists, we expected that we, that we needed to hold the Statue of Liberty long enough to get Reporters from the Spanish press. Sure, absolutely. El Diario La Prensa, um, you know, every TV to cover it before people got arrested. Yeah. But um, what happened turned out very different. Um, once the takeover took place, all kinds of different law enforcement agencies got in the one of the hands in the in the arrest. Yeah. The FBI, the Federal Park Police, NYPD, bombing arson squad, terrorist <laughs> unit. All these people arguing who was in charge and, you know, and hours after hours began to pass and the people were in the, on the statue. Okay, yeah. They had taken over the statue, throwing everybody out. You know, the, the guards, they locked the place up. But we didn't expect to be in there that long. Sure. <laughs> so there was no water, no food. Okay, they shut the electricity off. They shut the water off. Yeah. They shut the phones off. We didn't have walking to office or anything at that time. Yeah. Okay. So we were communicating with the public phones. We had gotten the numbers of the public phones inside, and we had gotten the numbers of the public phones in Battery Park. And that's how we were communicating. Sure. And 
time dragged on. So we um I, I made the decision that I had to figure out a way of getting some water, food, cigarettes to the people that were inside. Yeah. And um I called to the person that had access to a bank account, I asked them to pull out all the money from the bank account. And um, put him to research how to rent a helicopter. Yeah. And send somebody to a supermarket to buy water, food, sandwiches, all the stuff, cigarettes. Um, and we were going to drop it off on the ledge of the Statue of Liberty. Sure. Um, but then um, the news people came to us to tell us that they have placed a 10,000 foot ban of aircrafts around the Statue of Liberty. So you couldn't get a helicopter there. So anyway, we went through all of this drama in the court. <laughs> there was a guy named, if I remember correctly, Barry Farber, who was a right wing radio announcer. Mm. Um, he showed up to Battery Park demanding to be taken to the Statue of Liberty as a hostage in exchange for the hostages that we had in the Statue of Liberty. <laughs> and we kept saying, there are no hostages in the Statue of Liberty. <laughs> no, but I'm glad. It was big, you know, drama, okay? It was, it was a whole day of drama. Oh my God. Um, anyway, <laughs> um, at the end, they went in, they arrested everyone and uh, took them to the Metropolitan House of Detention and then to federal court and they were charged there. Um, so that's the story of take, uh, take over the Statue of Liberty to the wow, best okay. of my recollection, I understand. It's a long time ago. <laughs> sure, sure. And, and you, you participated again in, was it 2000, 2001? 2001, well, yeah, this is what happened then. <clears throat> First of all, there was a group of us that had plans that were considering taking over the Statue of Liberty again in 1998, which would have been the centennial of the invasion of Puerto Rico by the United States. Sure. Okay. That plan, um, was um, scrapped because one of the participants was a reverend who taught at John Jay College. Mm. And what happened was that his, amongst his students were cops and FBI agents and people like that. Yeah. And um, one of the agents approached them and told them, don't do what you're planning to do because we are aware of it and you're going to get arrested before you do it. So we scrapped that. Apparently, one of the people involved had made a phone call oh. from New York to Chicago and the call was intercepted. And that's how the FBI found out about it. So that was cracked. Okay. Yeah. Uh, then in 2001, I got a call. Uh, there's a, a brother here in Puerto Rico who many people around the world know. His name is Alberto de Jesus, but he is known as Tito Kayak. Mm. Ito Kayak became famous because he um, intercepted ships that had nuclear material in them and blocked them with his kayak. Yeah. Okay. And he, had, oh, he was also um, one of the first people to intervene in Vieques. Um, going into 
the shooting range where they will actually do the shooting. Sure. Because when people, in, you know, went in there, they had to stop the shootings. Yeah. To arrest the people. So he had, you know, been involved in the Bicker struggle. And he arrived in New York and he, um, I didn't know him. I knew of him. Yeah. Okay. Um, I got a call from a contact that tells me, listen, Tito Kayak is here and he wants to meet you. Can you meet him? It was Saturday afternoon. We went to a diner by Yankee Stadium Saturday evening and we met. Yeah. And he tells me, look, I'm told that you were one of the people that planned and carried out to take over the Statue of Liberty back then. And I need for you to tell me as much as you remember about what it was like, what the problems are, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So I said, look, yeah, I could tell you all that, but the problem is that since we did it, they changed all the protocol. They changed all the arrangements. Yeah. Okay? And those I don't know. Yeah. And, you know, we need to do some surveillance again, blah, 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 blah. And he tells me, no, you don't understand. I'm doing this tomorrow morning. <laughs> <on their morning. laughs> I said, well, why? Just because that Sunday was the Sunday of the New York City Marathon. Mm. And there was international press in New York City yeah. for the marathon. So he wanted to carry it on the day where there will be international press to do a kind you know, to do a takeover that would have international impact in support sure. of the struggle of the people of the Echoes. Anyway, um long story short, um I worked all night because again you don't use phones so you call somebody tell them, listen I need to meet you meet in one place walk to another tell them, so I needed to contact lawyers um contact um press that was trustworthy yeah videographers photographers reporters like Anyway, and for them to be available again without me telling them what was happening. Sure. Okay. Um, so that the takeover would, take, would happen the next day, that Sunday morning. Yeah. Um, this takeover was different because um, his plan was not to hold the Statue of Liberty, but to be able to get to the top. And he already gotten a key to oh. the windows at the top of the statue. Yeah. Um, to climb on top of the Statue of Liberty, to hang some banners for Vieques. Yeah. And you know, I told her, bro, that's insane. You know, you have any idea what the winds are up at the top of the Statue of Liberty? <laughs> you can't just stand on top of the statue. <laughs> they go, don't let me worry. About I worry about that. Don't worry. <laughs> that's what he did. Okay. He actually climbed out a window and climbed on top of the statue, hung some flags. I was downstairs with the press people yeah. that I have brought to come to the event. But the police saw us with cameras taking what was taking place on top, so they arrested me mm -hmm. as the person in charge. So that, that was my second involvement with the I'm the only person that's been involved in both takeovers of the Statue of Liberty. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Wow. Um, and I know you, you mentioned that you, um, uh, for a long time, were an organizer uh, for workers, was it in solid waste and recycling? Is that right? 
Yes, yes. Uh, well, the way that went down was um, I was a construction worker. Um, precisely because of the takeover of the Statue of Liberty, one of my co-workers um, had heard that I was one of the people involved in the takeover of the Statue of Liberty. Yeah. I was working in a construction site. And I was approached by members of LIUNA, Laborers International Union of North America, mm. and asked to come to a meeting. And it was to offer me a job as a union organizer, not with the construction local, but with the solid waste and recycling local. Sure. Um, back then it was, uh, Local 958, for remember correctly, or hmm. Um, it had been a um, a labor local that was riled with 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 corruption, all of that. Yeah, and they had gotten rid of the business agent and replaced them with this young man named Michael Hess from. And he heard about me, so he wanted to meet me, to hire me, to work for him. Yeah. That's how I got involved uh, with uh, organizing workers in the waste and recycle industry. That's where I worked until I retired. I see. And is is that local New York City wide, or is it specific? Yeah, to yeah. It's a New York City, a New York City, and New York State. Parts of New Jersey and parts of Connecticut. Okay, it's a big, uh, big local one hundred and eight now. I see. Yeah. Um, and uh, are there particular experiences in your union organizing that you'd like to speak about? Well, it's uh, <laughs> it's very interesting because um, organized labor. Um, has a lot of racism. Yeah. Okay. Definitely. Um, and the garbage industry is controlled by corporations and a lot of mob connected people. Definitely. And they were very used to doing whatever the hell they wanted. Yeah, I bet. By the way, and this is another coincidence, okay? As a community activist, I was a founding member of something called the South Bronx Clean Air Coalition. Yeah, your daughter mentioned that actually. Yeah, so um, we began, because the South Bronx is part of the asthma corridor. Yeah, okay. yeah. Definitely. Um, and the air quality is one of the worst in the country. So we created this coalition and we created it specifically because they were building a medical waste incinerator on 138th Street in the South Downs. Yeah. And we decided that we could not allow that to happen. Sure. So, um, at that time, if I remember correctly, it was a Remtech Corporation yeah. that was doing this. Eventually, they sold the project to BFI. Mm. Um, and, um, We, what we did was, again, it was about organizing the community, educating, informing, mobilizing the community so they would understand what was being done against them and activating them to do something for themselves. Yeah. Empowering yeah. themselves. For sure. Um, and, um, 
we worked very hard at that. And um, there was a lot of corruption with local politicians that have been paid off. Yeah. That, the, that whole drama. Um, and at one point, we were approaching all the elected officials. A lot of them didn't even want to meet with us. Yeah. So we said, we'll have to do something. And um, what we did at that time was a sister named Marianne Feinberg, um, a brother named Carlos Padilla, who was a local community businessman. Mm. Um, we had the coalition um, and we planned a takeover because if they didn't want to pay attention to us, yeah, they were going to have to pay attention to something that we did. Yeah, for sure. And what we decided to do was to shut down the Bruckner Expressway. Wow, yeah. Um, what we did was that we recruited people. We got a, a bus and a couple of trucks. We made some banners. And about seven o'clock in the morning, when all that traffic is coming from Westchester and Connecticut, we got on the southbound lane of the Bruckner Expressway, put all the, put the bus and the two trucks yeah. side by side and stopped. <laughs> Everybody got out, got across the highway, pulled out the banners and the flags, the trucks took off, and we sealed the Bruckner Expressway at morning rush hour. Wow. And what that did was that all of a sudden, all the politicians wanted to talk to us. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> Eventually, the incinerator was shut down. Yeah. Oh, it's an empty building now at 130 Street. Yeah. Wow. Um, uh, and then when it happened that when I went to work for the union, I wind up going to negotiations, disciplinary actions against the same bosses from BFI. Yeah. That knew me from the South Bronx Senior Coalition. <laughs> <laughs> so I had a great time. <laughs> I bet so. I bet I, I, I wouldn't <laughs> give anything to see their faces when you walked in the room. <laughs> oh, it was hilarious. It was hilarious. <laughs> but it was very helpful because, you know, the way they saw me, the way they perceived me was, this is one guy you can't fuck with. Yeah. Because yeah. the guys do anything. Okay. You shut down yeah. Bruckner Expressway. So it helped a lot of my members. <laughs> yeah. Um, how long was the struggle uh, that the South Bronx Clean Air Coalition uh, waged? How many well, years? It, if I remember, I'm gonna go. If I remember correctly, it was about three years ago. Three years. Three years. Yeah. Three years, yeah, and then he continued on, um, just doing other stuff, um, you know, around air quality and the asthma corridor stuff. Um, uh, it, it, the organization lasted quite a few years, but the struggle for the incinerator been lasted about three years. Sure, sure. Um, throughout all of the different organizations and movements that you were involved in, uh, what, what are some of the uh, most reliable um, coalition partners or uh, organizations? I'm sure they shifted over the years, but what are some of the most reliable allies and coalition partners that you were able to form over the years? Well, I mean, I... Um... I've had many and many who I've lost contact with in the course of the years, and many whose name I've forgotten. But sure. I could tell you that, for example, people like 
Ramon Jimenez, Venus Torres, uh, people like Marianne Feinberg, people like Carlos Padilla, um, uh, many people who rose um, to contribute to important struggles in our community yeah. at a time when they were very much needed. You know, I think, I think that at the end of the day, um, what's important is the lessons that people can take. Many things have changed. I mean, look, look for example, an another issue that I've been involved in for many, many years, the issue of police brutality. Sure. Okay. I remember before I joined the movement, but that I went to this demonstration, Back in 1970. Yeah. Okay. The Young Lords called a demonstration from East Harlem, El Barrio, yeah. to the United Nations. The demonstration had three demands independence for Puerto Rico, the freedom of the nationalist prisoners, and an end to police brutality in our communities. Sure. Okay. This is 1970. Many people today believe that the problem of police brutality and murder is something new. <laughs> that is something that is now because Black Lives Matter has raised the issue. Yeah. No, it's now in the consciousness of a lot of people because today just about everybody has a phone with a camera. Yeah, yeah. That's why. Yeah. So things are posted. So people see them. But the problem of police violence and murder is as long as our history in the United States. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. And I think that it's extremely important that we educate people, that we inform people, that we help people learn or use their critical thinking to understand what they are seeing. Because the other part of it is that we are also uh, deluged with you know, explanations, justifications, rationales yeah. for the things that law enforcement does. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, you know, I'll give you an example. Recently, there was a killing of a 12-year-old kid in Chicago. Back sure. on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, the kid, <coughs> excuse me, the kid apparently had a gun. Okay? Yeah. But if you see the video, the kid had thrown the gun away and raised his hands and then been shot to death. Yep, yep. yep. Okay? But the way that the media explains it, the rationales are, well, he had a gun, he deserved to die. No, cops' job is not to execute people. It yeah. is not their right to execute people. For sure. Okay? It is their duty to safeguard people. And if someone is committed a crime, arrest them. Yeah. To be tried in a court of law. Yeah. Not to be punished by the cops. Yeah. See, but, in, you know, all of that thinking is mushed up in the minds of many people. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I think that is important. The biggest weapon that we have is our ability to inform, educate, organize, and mobilize Definitely. our people. Okay, on the variety of different issues. And it is up to us 
to link these issues together because they are part of a much bigger problem, Absolutely. which is the politics of the governments under which we live. Okay. We know we can continue to struggle for justice and the killing of this one or the killing of the other one or the brutality committed against the other one. But these things are going to continue to go on. And it's going on with the same power structure of the people that, you know, indulge in denying people education, Definitely. And denying people health care, miseducating people, misinforming people, exploiting people. So it's part of a bigger, and we, it's our job to link it and to make it into a movement that's going to change the society in which we live. Absolutely. Yeah, it's all, all a much larger, it's a small part of a much larger genocide that, you know, the U.S. government is, has been waging now for centuries on poor people and uh, people in its various colonies and all around the world, really. Um, and uh, that international perspective is still uh, uh, sometimes lacking in... Uh, you know, that, as you know, like John saying, international perspective, look, the issue of Palestine yeah. has been an issue since the Second World War, since the creation since the fabrication of Israel. Definitely. They created Israel by stealing land from Palestine. Yeah. Israel is not a country. Okay. And now there have been many thousands of people in Palestine that have been victims of this. There has been many moments in which the struggle has reach proportions that the world media can't ignore. Yeah. But the struggle for Palestine is a struggle every day. People suffer in Palestine every single day. But as time goes on, and unless it's in the media, we tend to put it in the back burner. Definitely. And forget about it until something dramatic happens again. Now the bombings in Gaza, you know, brings it into prominence. And they try to cover it up. And eventually the attention lessens and lessens and we tend to forget. We need to change the way we do our thinking, the way we look at the world. Yeah. I remember 1970, 71, marching in support of the PLO. Yeah. You know? When Yasser Arafat read right, the PLO. A lot of people don't know who Yasser Arafat was. I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very, very true. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, and... Uh, <laughs> In the in the U.S. itself, the struggle for for Puerto Rican independence is, uh, of course, a very parallel parallel struggle with its own particularities. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, mean, I, I have very very interesting. There was a demonstration here in Puerto Rico about a month ago, and there's a large Palestinian community that lives in Puerto Rico. Um, I went. Oh, the Puerto Ricans went. But in conversations with members of the Palestinian community, they don't understand the similarities in our situation. Sure. Even though they live in Puerto Rico. Yeah. And the reason for that, again, is lack of information, lack of education, lack of organizing, see? Because yeah. they see the way that Israel is treating the Palestinians and it's 
you know, it's a relationship to the United States. And then they look at Puerto Rico, and the conditions presently in Puerto Rico are very different. Yeah. But they don't seem to know, okay, that from the perspective of the United States, the issue of Israel-Palestine is an international issue, where as the issue of Puerto Rico is a quasi-domestic issue. Yeah. They can't carry out attacks on Puerto Ricans in the same way as they do against Palestinians. Yeah. They yeah. can't discriminate against Puerto Ricans today the way they do against Palestinians. See, the conditions are different, but they're not understood. Sure, sure. Absolutely. Well, listen, I think this is what I got for now. If you review this interview and have some questions, maybe we could uh, have a second round. Sure, sure. Um, I have one final question for you, if that's all right. Okay. Uh, so it's a, a, a pretty, uh, pretty broad question, but um, uh, what does the Bronx represent to you? The Bronx is my home. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. The Bronx is my home. The, the Bronx is the place where, um, where I was formed. Sure. Where I became an adult. Okay, and where I developed politically. Yeah. It's a home, home to my family. We still live there. Yeah. My sons, my daughters, my grandkids. Yeah. You know, so, yeah, it's home. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, I'm really happy to. Uh, uh to live in uh, a place where uh where you and others like you uh have lived and struggled for so long um and uh very grateful for you for everything that you shared today so thank you my pleasure all right all right well take care. Uh, you take care too and good talking to you vicente okay bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.